So good morning again, and welcome to the launch event of the Guide to Strengthen the Role of Women in Peacebuilding, Developing Practical Negotiation Skills and Mediation Networks in the Americas. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Magdalena Talamas, and I am the director of the OAS Department for the Promotion of Peace. Prior to this position, I served as a special representative of the Secretary General for Belize Guatemala Affairs and oversaw the civilian peacekeeping mission on the ground for more than 10 years. I have been with the OAS for over 31 years. The publication that we are presenting today was uh, jointly uh, developed by the OAS Department for the Promotion of Peace, the Conflict Analysis Research Center and the University of Kent, at the University of Kent and the Forum of Federations within the framework of the Café Diplomatico Initiative with the hope that it will contribute to continue strengthening the invaluable role that women play in the field of peace building. I would like to take this opportunity to reiterate our most sincere appreciation to everyone involved in this process, uh, whom we have duly recognized in the guide, but most especially Natalia Melgarejo from the Secretariat for Strengthening Democracy, Professor Loisides from the University of Kent, Professor Chelik from Savansi University, and Mr. Liam Whittington and Jamie Thomas from the Forum of Federations. You will have the opportunity to hear from our partners directly at the end of the program when they offer concluding remarks. We are honored today uh, to have the participation of a highly distinguished group of individuals who have graciously joined us to celebrate this occasion, including none other than our own Secretary General, Dr. Luis Almagro, who will offer opening remarks shortly, followed by an illustrious panel of experts, including Ambassador Sandra Honoré, special, former Special Representative of the UN Secretary General in Haiti, Ambassador Jason Tolan, Director General for Latin America and the Inter-American Inter Relations at Global Affairs Canada, Dr. Maria Noel Baeza, UN Women Regional Director for the Americas and the Caribbean, and Her Honor Elizabeth Solomon, Caribbean Representative of the Women Mediators Across the Commonwealth Network. They will share their views and unique personal insights on today's subject, the role of women in peacebuilding, and discuss some of the most important issues that have been raised in the guide. We are very pleased to see so much interest and so many people registered for today's event, and we have thus allocated some time at the end of the program for questions and interaction with our very special guests. So with that, it is now my distinct honor to introduce OAS Secretary General, uh, Dr. Luis Almagro, and uh, although he needs no introduction, allow me to share some brief words about him. Secretary Almagro was re-elected for a second term as Secretary General of the OAS in March 2020. He was first elected as Secretary General of the OAS in March 2015. Upon taking up the leadership of the OAS, he announced that the central theme of his administration would be more rights for more people and that he would work to be the voice of the voiceless. As Secretary General, Dr. Almagro has prioritized defense of democracy and human rights in his daily work and does not hesitate to speak out when democracy and human rights are being trampled. Before joining the OAS, Dr. Almagro, was a career diplomat with extensive regional and international experience and served as foreign minister of Uruguay from 2010 to 2015. So without further ado, I am honored to give the floor to Secretary Almagro. Thank you. Thank you, Magdalena. Um, thank you, everybody. Good morning. It is uh, my distinct honor to be here with you today to present the guide to strengthen the role of women in peace building. Developing practical negotiation skills and mediation networks in the Americas, and to welcome the panel of experts that has convened to, convene, to comment on the guide and to share their invaluable expertise and personal experiences on the subject. The guide is a joint effort of the OES Department for the Promotion of Peace, the University of Kent, and the Forum of Federations to advance United Nations Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace, and Security, which was adopted more than two decades ago to highlight the vital contributions of women in conflict prevention and peace building, and to identify concrete steps that must be taken to ensure women's full participation and involvement in peace processes. Today, the concept of peace in the Americas is increasingly linked to democratic stability. Democracy cannot exist without the equal participation of women in all political and decision-making areas. In the same manner, we cannot have peace without women's full and meaningful involvement in all aspects and stages of peace processes. For this reason, 
This year's Café Diplomatico, the annual training program in mediation and negotiation for OAS member states, focuses on the role of women in peace building and provides participants with the knowledge and skills required to integrate a gender perspective in peace and reconstruction processes at all levels. The insight of the leading female voices that participated in the program, combined with the rich exchanges between the international renowned practitioners and the workshop participants, produced a wealth of knowledge which was compiled and summarized to produce this guide. The guide also includes information on the national action plans that are being advanced by our member states to effectively implement resolution 1325 including best practices and lessons learned in women's rights and empowerment the statistics and valuable data on the differentiated impact of conflict and violence as well as the pandemic on women and girls regional contributions to prevent and criminalize violence against women including those within the framework of the convention of belen do pará gender-specific achievements with formal peace processes in OES member states in line <coughs> with United Nations Resolution 1325. Best practices to establish regional and sub-regional networks of women mediators to link the experiences and expertise of women working in the field, and a series of conclusions and recommendations to address gender challenges in conflict scenarios and to advance inclusion of women as negotiators, mediators, and peace builders. I would also like to take this opportunity to reiterate the importance and success of the partnership that has been forged between the University of Kent, the Forum of Federations, and the OES Department for the Promotion of Peace to jointly implement programs directed at protective promoting peace at the national and subnational levels. As all of you know, the OES plays a pivotal role in the region in preventing and managing crisis and conflict, but it often lacks the resources needed to strengthen and expand its training and capacity building opportunities in the field of peace building and conflict management. This invaluable alliance has enabled us to offer states of the art training to strengthen the institutional capacity of the OES member states in the use of peace and conflict resolution mechanisms, and to better prepare relevant actors for future participation in managing conflict, peace negotiations, and peace building in the region. To date, more than 120 diplomats from, 30, from 32 OAS member states have received high level training through the Cafe Diplomatico training workshop. In future, we hope to be able to expand the program to include other government officials civil society workers, NGOs, academic, and other practitioners at both the national and subnational levels throughout the Americas. Finally, I would like to congratulate everybody involved in the production on this guide, of this guide and of once again express my sincere appreciation to the illustrious experts joining us today who have taken time from their very busy schedules to help us celebrate the publication of the guide and underscores the groundbreaking work of women for justice, peace, and security. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Magdalena. You're mute, uh, Magdalena. Yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, thank you very much, Secretary Anario. Thank you for. Uh, your words of welcome and for sharing your thoughts on the importance and value uh, of this guide, uh, especially for those who have not had the chance to see it yet. Uh, we are indeed uh, very grateful for your participation today. So uh, now we can move on to our panel discussion. I believe all the technical issues have been resolved. Is that correct? Okay. So, which as I mentioned earlier, um, and Secretary Magro also mentioned, comprises a highly illustrious group of experts and practitioners in the field of peace building. Our first panelist is Ambassador Sandra Honore, who served as Special Representative of the UN Secretary General in Haiti, and she was also the head of the UN Stabilization Mission in Haiti. Prior to this position, she served as special assistant to the chief of the OAS electoral mission in Haiti and as chief of staff to the assistant secretary general of the OAS. She has worked as a career diplomat for Trinidad and Tobago, including as ambassador to Costa Rica. I would also like to add that 
it was during her tenure at the OAS as chief of staff to the assistant secretary general that I had the personal privilege to work directly with her on a number of occasions. And I cannot stress enough how at a time when there were very few women in senior ranks, we all looked up to her as an inspirational role model, widely admired for her hard work ethic and uh, integrity, um, impressive leadership skills and for paving the way for the next generation of women to occupy high level positions at the OS. So thank you for that Ambassador Honore, we have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Magdalena. You are too generous. Good morning to all, Secretary General Almagro, fellow panelists, Toland, Paisa, Solomon, to the partners, Professor Loisidis, Mr. Whittington, Professor Chelik, to you, Magdalena Talamas of the OAS Department for the Promotion of Peace, and Natalia Melgarejo. I wish to come. And the Forum of Federations, Kent, and the OAS Department for the Promotion of Peace for this initiative designed within the framework of the CAFE Diplomatico program. Thank you for the invitation to participate in this event to mark the publication of what I will refer to by the short name, The Guide. The Secretary General has already spelled out the name of the publication, which is being launched today and has aptly described it is a regional contribution to addressing gender challenges and advancing the inclusion of women at all levels of peace building processes in the Americas. As one of the several agencies charged with maintaining international peace and security within the system established under the UN Charter for that purpose, this focus of the OAS DPP and its partners can only be of great benefit to the organization and its member states. The landmark UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security reaffirmed inter alia the important role of women in the prevention and resolution of conflicts, peace negotiations, peace building, peacekeeping, humanitarian response and in post-conflict reconstruction and stressed the importance of their full participation and equal involvement in all efforts for the maintenance and promotion of peace and security. Allow me a few reflections based on my experience as the SRSG of the UN Secretary General in Haiti and Head of Medium Staff. A few reflections on what Haiti looked like in June 2004 when MINUSTA was established in response to the deteriorating political and security situation in the country. The mission was mandated to ensure a secure and stable environment within which the constitutional and political processes could take place. Any resemblance with anything that you see today is purely coincidental. Haiti in 2004 was in a profound state of instability and widespread political violence. A climate of lawlessness and impunity was affecting the everyday life of millions of Haitians. State authority was weak. The three branches of power were either non-functional or non-existent. The Haitian National Police was overwhelmed by the multiple threats to public order and the rule of law. I arrived in Minusta in 2013 in the ninth year of the life of the mission and served for four years until its closure in October 2017. The special representative has overall authority on the ground for the coordination and conduct of the activities of the 19 UN agencies, funds and programs in Haiti. So that collaboration was a very close and very intense. 13 and a half years after its establishment in October 2017, Haiti had a very different outlook. Although many challenges were still facing the country. The people were enjoying a considerable degree of security and greater stability. Political violence had diminished considerably. And as amazing as it might sound, armed gangs no longer held the population hostage. The Haitian National Police, of some 14,000 strong, had grown significantly in numbers and capacity. 
All three branches of power were in place with the executive and legislative branches restored to full function. MINUSTA was followed by a smaller peacekeeping mission for justice support in Haiti, comprising civilians and police, but no military, which functioned from 2017. By 2019, when the term on and mandate of MINUSTA was over, it was followed by a special political mission, the United Nations Integrated Office in Haiti, which is still serving there today. When Under Secretary General Lacroix briefed the Security Council at the close of New Just, he spoke of a political stalemate that was impeding the holding of legislative elections and stood to lead an institutional vacuum at the beginning of 2020. Against the background of what the situation has been over the past 18 months or so, it is interesting to note that the Under Secretary General emphasized that while peacekeeping in Haiti had done a lot to create and enable an environment for political and democratic processes to take place, there was a need for more political solutions to systemic political challenges. A quick word on UN female peacekeepers, civilian, military, and police. Women are deployed in all peacekeeping areas, police, military, and civilian, and have made a positive impact on peacekeeping environments, including in supporting the role of women in building peace and protecting women's rights. In all fields of peacekeeping, women peacekeepers have proven that they can perform the same roles to the same standards and under the same difficult conditions as their male counterparts. In 1993, women made up 1% of deployed uniformed personnel, but by 2020, out of approximately 95,000 peacekeepers, women constituted 4.8% of military contingents, and 10.9% of formed police units, and 34% of justice and corrections government provided personnel. The 2028 target for women serving in military contingents is 15% and 25% for military observers and staff officers. The 2028 target for women serving in formed police units is 20% and 30% for individual police officers. I should mention that from 2010 to 2019, a Norway-led specialized police team was deployed to MINUSTA and to MINUSTA to work on projects for combating sexual and gender-based violence. The specialized police team, the goal of that team was to build the capacity of the Haitian National Police to prevent, investigate, and prosecute sexual and gender-based violence, which had increased dramatically in the aftermath of the 2010 earthquake. And the Haitian National Police was neither sufficiently prepared nor equipped to combat it. Another interesting fact was that in January 2010, when the UN requested additional resources from NUSTA after the massive earthquake, the first contingent of a 110 member female formed police unit to be deployed by Bangladesh to a UN peacekeeping mission arrived in June 2010 to carry out humanitarian activities and to provide support for reconstruction efforts as well as community policing. This all-female police contingent, a novelty in Haiti, functioned up to the closure of MINUSTA in October 2017. Its commander, Kanam Rokta, said that her contingent was proud to be contributing to protecting human rights, especially of women, girls, and all children, and securing and maintaining law and order, thus making the environment stable. Mindful that, as UN Women has said, the economic empowerment of rural women, as farmers, entrepreneurs, and leaders, contributes to alleviating poverty, improving food security, and achieving gender equality. And mindful of some of the lessons learned from my peacekeeping experience in Haiti, which I believe highly relevant elsewhere in the Americas and the Caribbean, I wish to end by highlighting and expressing support in particular 
So two of the recommendations set out in the guide. Recommendation 11, which says that peace and development are interconnected and that rural women represent key agents for development. More work must be done to ensure adequate communication and inclusion between and among national and subnational partners through peace building processes. And recommendation 17, according to which civil society organizations must be supported and strengthened because they are the actors which monitor compliance and implementation of laws, including gender specific norms and regulations. Once again, my commendations and appreciation to the partners for the publication of the guide to strengthen the role of women in peace building, developing practical negotiation skills and mediation networks in the Americas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Honore, for that excellent presentation uh, and for sharing with us your unique experiences in Haiti, uh, leading one of the most complex and challenging missions that uh, are, are out there. Um, and uh, very much appreciated your comments of how women have demonstrated that they can perform the same peacekeeping and peace building roles uh, as, as men under the same standards. And uh, I was particularly interested in hearing about the a female contingent um, that was deployed, all female contingent that was uh, deployed to Haiti. Uh, we will also take note uh, of the, the two recommendations that you, you, you stressed, uh, I agree. Uh, we, in my own capacity, when I served as SRSG, um, uh, definitely peace and development and the link between both are, are something that need to be further explored. So once again, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Honoré for your participation today. And now we thank have uh, our, thank you. And now we have our second uh, panelist of the day, Ambassador Jason Toland. Um, Mr. Toland is the Director General for Latin America and Inter-American Relations at Global Affairs Canada. He has been assigned overseas to Argentina as Economic Secretary, Washington DC as, eco as Environmental and Counsel Counselor, in Berlin as Minister Counselor and most recently as Canada's Ambassador to Finland. Uh, previous assignments include Council and Executive Director of the Government of Canada's Trade Law Bureau. And prior to serving for the government, Mr. Tolan worked at various times as labor lawyer, research economist, and wine salesman. And uh, Mr. Tolan, your distinguished career in international relations speaks for itself, but I'm sure a lot of us would like to learn more about your expertise in the wine industry on another occasion. Um, but for now, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, and uh, I'm very pleased to be here for the launch of the guide. Um, I'm sorry that would not have been so prolix, that introduction, if I'd known you were reading it aloud. I think that uh, I'm with a group of people who know far more about this subject than I do. I'm looking at page 21 of the guide and realize that I'm not sure my government would have hired me if I was challenged to draw four straight lines to connect dying dots without lifting my pen. Um, the, uh, I, given the nature of the subject we're discussing today, it's, it's incumbent on me to mention that I'm speaking from unceded uh, territory of the Algonquin peoples. Um, and uh, because the, <clears throat> we in my government now live and breathe uh, conflict mediation, um, dispute resolution in every aspect of our governance. It's something that is, um, we, we learn quite early due to our constitutional system in Canada. And I have practiced that as a lawyer, but of course, in my, my experience in international relations, um, I also recognize the role of women peace builders. And it's tried to say that they're negotiators and mediators and, um, human rights defenders, peace activists. I mean, that's obvious. Well, it should be obvious. And I think that's one of the problems that we have to address. And the guide has done an excellent job of trying to capture is that women, even if they are, it's important that they are seen to be um, effective and trusted actors in communities, um, in the community defense against in response to conflict. Um, and their contributions to peace are invaluable, but they're often too, they're too often invisible or, and worse, discounted. Um, and 
I think the research, as everybody on this call will know, um, it, it shows that women's inclusion in peace processes leads to greater recognition of the outcomes. It leads to more stable outcomes, more, sust more sustainable outcomes, um, and greater recognition of the gendered aspects of conflict, um, whether hot conflict or cold conflict. Um, it, the the action plan that my government uh, instituted in 2017, it's coming to an end this year, has helped direct the efforts that we have, um, that we were already engaged in, but to give um, a framework to efforts to advance the women, peace and security agenda. Uh, I know that everybody on the line will know that we have an active feminist foreign policy. The, the women, peace and security agenda was an effort to try and consolidate some of the action that we would otherwise be doing and to give it free a, a, a shape in the theme of uh, women peace builders. Um, it, we have done that through programming, diplomatic um, and advocacy efforts in our, through our mission network, um, not just in New York and the OAS, but around the world. Um, and through regional and, uh, and multilat multilateral and regional initiatives where we underline the initiatives through specific references to uh, the, our action plan to try and incorporate partners um, in, in the work that we're doing with our mission network, um, including most recently in my experience in Finland. Um, sometimes we have active partners, sometimes we have, uh, we're pushing on open doors and sometimes we are not. Um, all the more reason that we have to push. Um, we have in recent years worked to ensure visibility in these various fora, uh, for instance, in the work that we did on the 10th anniversary of the WPS, um, uh, or 1325, sorry, at, um, in the UN, which had uh, global outreach for us, global consequences for our work. And specifically though, below the governmental level, working to create partnerships with civil society. Um, and also working to counter those who want to undermine progress. And I don't think it's a surprise to anybody on the line that there is not, we are not necessarily always working in one direction. Um, so a good example of that was the collective work in 2020 um, for the, uh, sorry, it was 20th anniversary of the UN Resolution 1325. And um, the, I'm, age, I'm dating myself, I think. And uh, at that time we had, um, an active campaign to support women peace builders at the grassroots level. Uh, sometimes it's money, but sometimes it's actually just people. Um, it's just active support from the government. Um, we also had an annual awards program uh, to highlight excellence, um, a global advocacy campaign, which was named Peace by Her, uh, that was promoted through our diplomatic networks to recognize and support uh, and also protect by raising the profile of women peace builders who might themselves have been at risk and on a, a shocking number of them are at risk. Um, in 2020 and 2021 we also had uh, we co-chaired with Uruguay uh, the Women Peace and Security Focal Points Network. Um, there were about 90 countries involved and regional organizations including US, implementing the WPS agenda. I think um, through that co-chairing we uh, it's difficult sometimes to measure outcomes, but we did have, um, of course, we have high level events. That's part of our job in diplomacy is to raise profile. Uh, we had working group sessions on women peace builders, which is partly to ensure networking, to raise the profile of action plans so that people are aware of the work that is being done. Uh, and also be aware of the types of projects and funding that is available to support them. Um, we had, a, I think, what we believe to be a groundbreaking discussion on best practices for um, an inclusive uh, WPS agenda. And we also, I think as part of that work to consolidate communities of practice through the hosting of virtual events. I suppose this is an example, but you know, the, uh, the uh, specifically identified challenges that might um, be specific to countries, might be specific to regions or to certain communities. Uh, she, um, that includes uh, through hosting an interactive website for WPS resources that allows focal points, national focal points to exchange information um, and uh, to discuss best practices and poor practices, as well as supporting the Let's Talk uh, WPS video series that's on YouTube and on that website to raise awareness of the work of the women peace builders. And of course, Canada has actively contributed 
uh, perhaps not as much as I would like, but um, to uh, the uh, numbers mentioned by Ambassador Honoré in respect of uh, uh, women um, in, in policing. Uh, we are we do have uh, we have a number of women in uniform. We have one of the highest percentages of women in uniform um, of any NATO country, um, and uh, possibly the highest. Um, but of course, we have an active program to support women in, in uh, the peace building exercise through uh, policing and mediation training. I, I could list more, but of course, that's what the guide is for and does an excellent job of it. I think that the, the frame, uh, this helps to frame the, the work that the officials are doing. And it's important that we officials remember the work that's being done. Um, I think the first thing that the guide helps to point out is that there's a lot of work to do. Um, women's partic participation in peace processes uh, would be lower without our collective work. I think that's clear. The guide also mentions that. And we have to focus on the positive as well. There's a lot, there's a lot to be done. I think the number was something like 23%. Um, a process, there's a number of processes that don't have any women involved in them. But uh, I like to think that the work that we've done has helped make sure that there have been women involved in processes. But it's still too, still too low. And uh, we're part of, we're just like one part of a remarkable exercise, uh, considering how much has already been accomplished. And I, um, I recall the reference to the Continental Network of Indigenous Women that's been going, I think, since 1995. In some senses, we're late to the game. Our national action plan, plans, though, are, are enabling flat framework. We're not, we're not reinventing the wheel. What we're doing is helping, especially the national level, but also the sub-national level, and through our regional networks to create the opportunities and to and to solidify the or to strengthen the existing frameworks that will allow the groups that are already active to flourish and we will provide funding and expertise and also help to establish legal pathways um, for permanent outcomes i think that's very important so we're part of a bigger process um, and the an excellent initiative of cafe diplomatico um, under the OS, oas leadership um, and the Secretary General's leadership is an excellent part of that. Um, so I want to frame the authors, uh, or praise the authors for framing that process very effectively, um, both of the progress made and the significant work that we have left to do. So, uh, merci beaucoup pour l'invitation, and uh, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Tolan for your uh, very important presentation on Canada's um, perspective on gender sensitive uh, peace building. Uh, we all know that Canada plays a very prominent role in the international stage to advance the women, peace and security agenda. And we are all very grateful uh, for Canada's unwavering uh, commitment to these efforts. I think that uh, from your presentation, a number of issues stand out that maybe we'll have uh, some time at the end of the program to further discuss. But I thought uh, it was quite interesting how Canada has incorporated other partnerships in the national action plans to be able to uh, implement it more effectively. Um, and, and then three, three issues that you were raised, the, the, the importance of raising awareness, uh, of sharing best practices, and of the, of the funding challenges, which, um, we, we do address in the guide, but they are, um, they are issues that come, uh, that come across uh, over and over again. And, and I think that we have to, to further discuss them if we have time at the end of the program. Thank you very much. So um, now our third distinguished uh, panelist is Her Honor Elizabeth Solomon. Judge Solomon currently represents the Caribbean region of the women mediators across the Commonwealth network and she serves as the director of the mediation board of trinidad and tobago focusing on designing and implementing uh, inclusive peace building processes dr solomon you have the floor thank you very much um it's really a, a great honor to be part of this discussion and thank you for the opportunity um if you allow me i'm going to single out my pleasure being on a panel with my country person sandra honorary because it's um uh, a real honor to be, uh, you know, to be in your company again. I haven't seen you in a very long time. Um, I also want to congratulate the OAS and Cafe Diplomatico for this initiative, for this guide. And from the women mediators across the Commonwealth, I think it is a huge opportunity for us to participate in this dialogue. And I hope that it's a, it's a 
as I said before, an opportunity to move forward and participate. So I actually have a slightly different perspective um, on the role of women in peace building. Um, the first point I'd like to make is simply that it is high time that the inclusion of women at every level and in every form of peace building is simply normalized. Resolution 1325 was a landmark decision by the Security Council to ensure women in conflict were protected, represented and included in the processes towards peace. But that was 22 years ago. In spite of the evidence that the work of women mediators benefits peace and security across the Commonwealth and the Americas, women still face structural barriers to their participation in mediation. Women mediators are not adequately recognized or supported in their work and continue to face discrimination and have to work much harder to be treated as equals. The work of strengthening the role of women in peace processes is multifaceted. It calls for an alignment, not just of Resolution 1325 with Sustainable Development Goal 16, the promoting of peaceful and inclusive societies for all, for sustainable development, providing access to justice for all and building effective institutions. But in the Commonwealth Caribbean in particular, and in other parts of the Commonwealth we have found, it is also relevant to have a sustained focus of promoting Security Council Resolution 2242, which is to ensure the participation and leadership of women in developing strategies to counter violent extremism and build their capacity to do so effectively. I take this broad view of peace processes, particularly because of the context that we are focusing on, the Americas, and more specifically, as I said, the Commonwealth Caribbean. Several years ago, I was part of an OAS-led panel of experts that examined peace building in the Americas. The question we were grappling with is what does peace building mean in this region of few formal conflicts, but epidemic levels of violence, or as the indigenous women of Peru describe it, violences. What we arrived at on that panel was the term unconventional conflict, which is essentially a protracted state of non-peace. And I chose to highlight this because there is a need for recognition and support for the role that women play in brokering durable peace in these situations of non-peace, even where their work does not involve post-conflict recovery or sit squarely within the definition of participating in a peace process, or there is no imminent threat of open conflict. Our populations are suffering from armed violence of an unconventional kind. They're existing in a state of non-peace that is rooted in social problems that profoundly impact on their sustainable development prospects. And driving these trends is a high level of violent crime, geographic areas of weak state infrastructure and control, and associated human insecurity. The violence is motivated by unequal status, power relations, including domestic violence and abuse, gang feuds, turf wars, fights to control areas, theft, extortion, trafficking of weapons, women and children, distributing narcotics and contract killings. Many of the worst affected communities have bad housing, limited access to amenities, poorly performing schools, low levels of educational achievement, few employment opportunities, and while men may generally be the perpetrators and victims of gun violence, women are most affected by the insecurity, the undermining of their freedoms and the power driven violence. Fundamentally, this is a crisis of governance superimposed upon the regional reality of low and declining confidence in governments and politics. A recent UNTP study revealed that the proportion of population in countries in the region who believe their country is governed in the interest of a few powerful groups is growing. In 2018, it averaged 79%. My point really is inclusive dialogue is critically needed in this region to regain trust in institutions. So what is the role of women mediators networks in this scenario? Women experience conflicts and social upheavals differently from men. We are aware of this. Women are the mothers of the perpetrators 
and the protectors of the families. Women console the victims and they bury the dead. Women are the nurturers of future generations. Women can be destroyers also. And we found that in Trinidad and Tobago when we had the highest level per capita of uh, foreign fighters leaving this region to go to the MENA region, women were a large number of that group of people. So women can be destroyers also, and they will enter the arena for their cause. Women traverse a range of identities, which is probably what makes us good mediators. The Women, Peace and Security Agenda has to be geared towards more than increasing the numbers and visibility of women. A transformative agenda must mean engaging much more deeply so that all their experiences are fully reflected and integrated into the design and implementation of peace processes and national infrastructures for peace. The Women Mediators across the Commonwealth has conducted a number of member-led research projects on enablers of peace and have participated in cross-regional dialogue around challenges to peace in different contexts. Women Mediators Networks have created platforms for strengthening advocacy around more inclusive processes, but also for deepening understanding of effective strategies at all levels of peace building. For many women, the decision to intervene is made even without having had any formal training or formal mediation skills. Women's informal interventions usually begin at the community level. Women mediators have their fingers on the pulse of the community. They see and they understand conflict, are driven to address it, and, and women are, they understand conflict and they're driven to address it to prevent it from escalating. To do this, they reach out to others in the community, including leaders and elders who have the power to influence others. This enables women to establish the consent of parties to be involved in an inclusive process of mediation or dialogue. It also begins a longer process of building relationships and trust with parties, a process that characterizes the work of women mediators. For women, mediation is not a clearly defined or a linear process in which arranged agreement is the only goal. Rather, it is a process of sustained dialogue with many and diverse stakeholders that unfolds over time. Beyond the commonly accepted features of mediation, WMC members tend to employ, employ a diverse range of skills and approaches that they build on to help in their work. There is a clear emphasis on collaborative working and the importance of developing relationships of trust and confidence to enable them to successfully mediate conflicts. Women mediators demonstrate remarkable leadership in their approach to mediation. Where conflicts arise, particularly in informal spaces, women often do not wait to be invited to intervene. They are proactive in identifying the issues causing the conflict and offering assistance to address them. On this point of women's experiences being reflected fully in peace processes, let me make a further point about the myth of qualification. I mean, of course, greater capacity can be a game changer. There is no doubt about that. But I think that we need to guard against an overemphasis on training of women. There is a repeated narrative that women need capacity building. It is a narrative that influences whether or not women are chosen to lead or to be integrally involved in peace processes. It is also a narrative that influences the resources that are allocated to women's inclusion in peace building. Our experiences as women involved in the violences are exactly the qualifications that you need in a peace process. Sure. Give us opportunities for other capacity building, but do not sit back and wait for women, women mediators to achieve some externally determined set of qualifications before making space for us at the table. Men are not asked to show their qualifications before they're invited to the mediation table, not even when they're appointed as the mediator. Our mantra within the WMC is appoint the women, and train the men. 
And I, I don't mean to um, discredit the, the points that are being made and the, the great work of um, Cafe Diplomatico, but this is a really important point that the women mediators across the Commonwealth have arrived at. And, and it is something that we feel very strongly about in terms of the manner in which women are approached to be engaged. So very quickly, um, I'd like to make a couple of, of recommendations that I think can support and build on the fantastic recommendations in the guide. The first is engage inclusivity as an imperative. Every voice is valid. And more than that, if all voices are not included in the process, it's not valid. It is as simple as that. <clears throat> Being connected digitally, I think, makes inclusion much, much more durable and doable but it also makes inclusion noisier. We must remain focused on our peace building craft to use technology for the purpose of building peace infrastructures. I think we also need to dust off our human rights approach and use it as a framework for implementing change. It creates a checklist of who should be the focus of how we engage. Non-discrimination is a core principle of human rights. Identifying and empowering the most vulnerable builds equity and it lifts our fellow humans up to equality. Aspirations of peace that are grounded in a common standard of treatment of each other. Thirdly, be empowered by the strength of diversity. And this is a particular sign significance to the women mediators across the Commonwealth because we have such a wide range of, of um, countries that we represent. Um, we have found that there really is a strength in diversity and we have to encourage the identity driven dialogues because within the Commonwealth and within the Americas and within all regions, we are not the same, but we are better and more durable communities because of each other. We need to invigorate the imperative of to be inclusive. National action plans or peace infrastructures, whatever you wish to call them need to be fully inclusive national dialogues that redesign the social compact, that challenge the private sector to articulate a meaningful purpose and that give voice to the aspirations of everyone. And on this point, governments and regional organi organizations can actively clear the path so that they can walk, that women mediators can walk more easily along this road. They can recognize their work, they can understand the value of their work at all levels. They can nurture young women mediators through training and opportunity, not just training, but also opportunity, <laughs> promote the work that they do nationally, regionally, and internationally, record and research their work, make them exemplars, protect women mediators and peace builders. This was a big issue we have found also, and also to create the space for women mediators to rest, recuperate, so that they can go again. And finally, to address the question of resources. It has been our experience that resources carved out and allocated to enabling women's inclusion are too easily redirected, often for important pressing demands like Ukraine. But the resources to enable the inclusion of women ought to flow automatically from any peace and security budget in which the full and equal participation of women is normalized. So thank you. I mean, I, I hope that this adds some, some value to this, to the, to the guide. Thank you again. Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Solomon, for those very insightful comments and for sharing the, the work that you advance within uh, your net Caribbean network. Um, they, we hope that those, those insights and those recommendations will be useful to our own efforts as we, uh, the partners of the Café Diplomatico, uh, will be developing within the next few months our own uh, regional network of, of women mediators. Uh, with respect to your comments, um, we would tend to agree in terms of how the challenges, peace building challenges have evolved. This hemisphere uh, represents about 9% of the population of the world, but uh, has 33% of the homicides. It is the, the most unequal 
region in the world, challenges while we some, some uh, would consider this a peaceful continent because of the lack of overt intercontinental conflict. In fact, it is uh, um, one of the most violent because of the levels of inequality and of poverty and of, and of corruption. And those seem to be the, the new peel, uh, peace building challenges that, um, that we, we need to address um, uh, together, both men and women. And uh, while well, I think we would also agree that it, it's not about training women, it's about gender sensitive training. Um, and I hope as well that this will be uh, the, 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 the way that we move forward. And, that, and I believe that this is the way that we have actually incorporated uh, our training programs within the Café Diplomatico um, uh, project. So once again, thank you so much for, for your very valuable um, uh, contributions today. And finally, uh, last but yes. definitely not least, we have uh, Dr. Maria Noel Baeza. Maria Noel, are you with us today? Yes, I'm You're here. Connected. Okay. Can Hi. you hear me? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So allow me to introduce uh, Maria Noel Baeza. Dr. Baeza assumed functions as UN Women Regional Director for the Americas and the Caribbean in July 2019. She has extensive experience in global and regional leadership and management, management positions at the UN, including as a director of the program division at UN headquarters, director of the UNOPS Global Portfolio Ser Services Office, UNOPS Regional Director for Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as various assignments at UNDP. And prior to that, she held different positions in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Uruguay. I have known Dr. Vaesa personally and professionally for over 30 years, uh, from the time that she was posted in Washington, D.C. And uh, way back when, we all knew that if anybody was going to break any glass ceilings, it was going to be Maria Noel. And she <laughs> has not disappointed. We are all very fortunate uh, to be able to have her guiding UN Women in the Americas and the Caribbean because we know that her work will be meaningful, it will be impactful, and have a lasting positive effect in the lives of so many women and girls throughout the region, especially the most vulnerable. Maria Noel, you have the floor. Thank you, Magdalena. You can't imagine how, what a pleasure to see you being a director in the EOS and, and see your career that was absolutely amazing. And it's a pleasure to see you after so long. And thank you so much to the University of Kent as well for organizing this cafe. And, and also thank you to my other um, uh, uh, citizen of Uruguay, the Secretary General of the OAS. So I think we are dominating the Uruguayans in this, <laughs> which is uh, fantastic. Uh, and uh, it was fantastic to hear uh, Madame Honoré and, and Jason Tolland, and also Judge uh, Solomon, um, you know, their, their views uh, has been amazing and, and the work they're doing as well. What, what I would like uh, to bring is the perspective of what we are doing in the region from the regional office, but also uh, congratulate you, Magdalena, for your leadership in launching the guide to strengthen the role of women in peace uh, building, in developing practical negotiation skills and mediation and networks. As you know, we are as well stimulating all these not just from your women, but also from Sahir, from the UN, from everywhere, because what the Americas needs is much more networks of mediators uh, and peacekeepers and women contributing to peacekeeping efforts all around our region in the Americans and the Caribbean. Uh, I also would like to say that uh, the resolution uh, 1325 has only just begun in Latin America because they are countries that never had an action plan and we are pushing many countries to do so. And I'm happy to say that uh, since I, I came to the region, we've been pushing and pushing and we got Mexico, we got uh, Colombia, Chile, uh, Nicaragua, Venezuela, also Uruguay, that has approved uh, the first uh, national plan of action and same as Peru and Argentina very, very recently. And also I'm happy to say that the ministers of defense has joined efforts in the region to really discuss how to implement these uh, action plans, how to increase uh, the, uh, the number and the value of uh, peacekeepers that go uh, for, that represent the UN from the region. And I'm happy to say that, that uh, 
we have countries in the region that are supporting the peacekeeping efforts in a very important number, but in the quality of the peacekeeping operations that they are doing. Um, what I would like also to say is uh, the challenges of sustaining peace go far beyond uh, conflict and post-conflict frustration. And as uh, Judge uh, Solomon well, say, well said, there are so many violence, distinct violence. Of course, the first violence is because of the patriarchal systems of violence against women that we are living in the region. And unfortunately, we have already almost 3,500 feminicides. Uh, so I imagine uh, by the end of the, of the year, we will overpass five, 5,400. And it's unconventional conflict and non-peace rooted, but rooted deeply in inequality. As Judge uh, Solomon said, and you, you said it, Magdalena, we are the most unequal region in the world. We lost so much space as women due to the pandemic. And the reason why we lost so much space in the economy is because we cannot participate in the economy because of care because we don't have systems of care that can allow women to leave their, their, their children, their uh, disabled, their, uh, you know, uh, their, their family at the care of, of, of a system. So we, we see women that have very little time to do anything else. So this is something that women are struggling, but the good news is that the community levels are so much soror using sorority of women, rural women, indigenous women, but still the state is not there to, to help it. And this is something that we have uh, prioritized, how to create those systems of care. And while we do that, we see the, that the challenge of sustaining peace and go beyond the post-conflict and conflict situation and go deep into the women, peace and security agenda, um, emanates the, of the conflict root causes that are difficult to address. Of course, inequality, poverty, discrimination, uh, and, and also crime and corruption, growing social unrest, increased uh, police violence as well, and attacks on aggression and aggressions in this region against uh, human rights defenders, women human rights defenders, this is a region that being a human right defender is the most dangerous in the world, but also environmental activists and uh, journalists is so dangerous to be a women journalist. So we are talking about um, a not being able to be in peace in all these professions. And, and of course, when it is a woman, it's much worse. So this affects the population facing exacerbation discrimination by class, by age, by gender, by race. Don't forget women, we are different. Afro-descendant, uh, indigenous, uh, women from all uh, diversity, uh, sexual diversity. And there you go in the intersectionality to much more difference of violence. Um, and, and unfortunately, we face that on a daily basis. Um, the region is also a scenario of the most significant migration flows, not only almost 6.9 million of Venezuelans that are in 18 countries in the region, but also all the influx of immigrants from Central America to Mexico and to Mexico from uh, the US uh, as a final destination. But imagine now the Darien, I am in, in Panama, uh, and, and the Darien has been converted into one of the most important places of, of traffic of, of people without, uh, without any structures and without even knowing how to, to solve this issue. So we are facing this migration and unfortunately with the migration is increasing the xenophobic and, and the lack of integration of communities. So we need more than ever the mediators and the women mediators that can also integrate uh, the migration flows into, into a, a new perspective. In addition, according to the World Meteorological Organization, nearly every sub-region in Latin America and the Caribbean is experiencing some form of extreme weather and climate changes that may potentially cause 
irreversible damage. And of course, it causes irreversible damage as well to the social structures. Uh, imagine the Hurricane Julia that happened now in, in Central America, or what of the severe uh, drought in Gran Chaco, or what is happening in, in, uh, in Ecuador, in Colombia. So we are facing this reality, which is a known conflict, but it's an anthropocenic you know, created by, by men. So the Women, Peace and Security Agenda focus on social conflict prevention. So we have to see all this in, into, into our diagnosis, into our analysis, but also into our actions, how to face and recognize these disasters and introduce them in the mediation that women are doing, which they are already doing. I agree with, with Jack Solomon, they don't need training. We need to recognize their leadership and we need to have the more catalytic role and potential role of the magnificent leadership that women's mediators have in our region. We need to enable them to, to act and, and of course, Imagine the importance of, of strength and mediation uh, in this in this context. Um, you young women have seen that we, we have been trying to recognize uh, as a trust trust uh, trusted partner, uh, and this is how, what we are trying to do from our technical work on women, peace, and security, and working with with governments. They they are not clear how to implement the, the, in the action plans of the 13, 20, 25, but we're trying to help them. Uh, and, and of course, uh, Canada is an, a fantastic partner. They created a fund, a trust fund that is called LC Fund, that is also supporting the different governments that are implemented their national uh, action plans. But we need to introduce migration and climate changes to all this, this perspective. Um, I think that the Women, Peace and Security agenda needs to have this broader and approachable um, and adaptable, addressing challenges of social instability, uh, their impact in democracy. Democracy is losing grounds in our region. And how is this connected to end inequality and to the, uh, the sustainable development? And of course, I want to give the perspective of youth youth in peace and security is critical. Uh, women, young women that are mediators, we need to continue supporting them uh, is, is critical. I think that in the last five years, we have expanded the relevance of the agenda of women, peace and security by carrying out several gender sensitive conflict analysis in the region. And this gender conflict sensitive analysis are critical for the conflicts that we have in the region, from Chile in the south uh, to, to Central America. So we need to see this sensitivity on conflicts analysis, which is, is different of what we are used to now. And of course, this conflictivity analysis uh, make us prioritize gender as a peace building. And we have also peace building fund uh, projects around the region by nationals and nationals that are integrating all, all these aspects. But the role of Women Mediators Network is critical to, to really um, help all the efforts that are being done uh, to end inequality and to address the economic gaps uh, between women and girls. Um, we have promoted also uh, including uh, the conflict analysis, but also the strengthening of women knowledge. Women already have their knowledge. We need to bring it to the surface and we need, everybody needs to learn how women are solving their problems, particularly the indigenous women uh, in all our continent. Uh, so um, efforts has been put uh, of creating a network of women mediator with a gender perspective. And for us, this is critical and we are prioritizing that. And I see that we can have a much bigger alliance if we, if we get all together. Um, and, and we need also to bring the Ibero-American system that is uh, doing this as well and the more the merry in this case, but with a vision, a vision of um, including their own knowledge because they know much better than we do. So I would say that the courage, the resilience of Latin American and Caribbean women and young peacekeepers 
and human rights defenders, indigenous defenders, Afro-descended women uh, defenders, we need to make sure that we protect them, that we protect them and we um, expand their voices. They have a voice that is not enough. We need to help them to continue expanding the, their voices. The individual and collective action of women human rights defendants is instrumental to address uh, discrimination and inequality, to promote civil, political, economic, and, and, and cultural rights, the human rights, but also to include context of prevention and peace and security in, in our region. I would like to highlight uh, a, a program that we have in Colombia called Pro Defensoras, Conectando Mujeres, Connecting Women, Defending Human Rights of Women in Brazil, uh, Women Rights Defenders in Mesoamerica. So in Colombia, Brazil, Honduras, Mexico, Guatemala, we are all trying to make uh, an effort uh, to, to really ensure that they are connected, that they share, uh, how they are facing the conflicts and how we can change this reality. So in closing, I would like to say that it's crucial to build a multi-stakeholder partnership. So I celebrate that we are here today, um, not only the state, but particularly the civil society, regional organizations, the UN, uh, the private sector, which is critical that they are involved as well and create a safe and environmental uh, uh, spaces for the work of women defenders. We need to support them, we need to protect it. And it's urgent as well to support the women's and feminist movement because they are the ones that have the trust of, of a community women that can help uh, identify uh, the mediators and reaffirm them in, the, in their amazing works. So we, we reaffirm the commitment to embrace and support the different expression of women and feminist groups uh, to continue uh, you know, working all together. So thank you very much and congratulations for, for this initiative that you call it cafe, but I think it's much more than that. It's, a, it's an instance to, to be together and to identify how can we work together. Thank you very much, Magdalena. Pleasure to, to be with you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vaesa, for that uh, excellent presentation, as, as always. Um, and for sharing uh, what some of the countries of the region have been doing through their national action plans and uh, how you have highlighted uh, that we still have a, a very, very long way to go uh, to implement, to fully implement Resolution 1325 in the Americas. Um, I would just like to highlight some of the things that you mentioned, which I, which I think are, are very important, uh, um, including the importance of in, including social challenges uh, such as migration and climate change to the women, peace and security agenda. Definitely, um, we have to uh, broaden um, the agenda to, to include these, these very important uh, issues. Um, also, working with partners, like you said, not, uh, not only governmental, intergovernmental agencies, the private sector, NGOs, um, La Unión hace la fuerza, right? The more people that we that we, that who, who who are working together, the more that we can raise the voices uh, um, of these uh, of the of women's challenges in in the in, in the world of uh, of peace building, and um, and yes, I think that pretty much. I mean that that's what stands out for me. I don't know uh, if we have time. Yes, we have uh, now time. We can move on to the third part of the program because I think. Uh, we would like to ask some specific questions that we've received for the panelists and um, maybe hold uh, an, an interactive uh, sec uh, session uh, before we conclude uh, the, the program today. I will start out by reading one of the first questions that we have. And this question is, will be posed to uh, all of the panelists. They can all, one or all are welcome to respond. So historically, uh, women have been marginalized from peace processes, particularly at the track one level, despite the fact that, as we know, they have been uh, traditionally excluded from uh, peace agreements, uh, and, uh, but they are often the ones who have been charged to making those agreements work on the ground in local areas. So how can we uh, ensure that women and other marginalized groups are included and involved within peacemaking and peace building processes?
Madalena, I can get a shot. <laughs> of course, yes, please. Well, I think that um, it is very important that we work together with the uh, feminist organizations, but as well with the state. We need to be close to the state, to the state at the local level, at the intermediate level, in the case of federal states and also with the government. I believe very strongly that when conflict arises and you never see women sitting next to the government uh, being, solving the problem <laughs> or presenting solutions. They are behind the scene. And that's why I insist that having conflict uh, analysis of where are those leaderships and how to trigger that those leaderships support, you know, in, in the case of a, of a conflict before, of course, before it starts. I think it's important that we raise the voices of this person. So, you know, even the press, the press is very important in, in, as well. In the media is also very important to, to bring their attention to these women because normally the press go and have uh, the interview with the men, <laughs> with the men that are in power. You know, uh, the media is the most patronizing <laughs> and patriarchal um, element uh, of the society. So we need to bring them, uh, bring them to, to light, uh, strengthen their, their public image and, and make sure that, that, you know, we know who they are. So, you know, when, when a conflict arises, we can go to them. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Noel. Would anybody else like to comment on this question? Well, since I'm speaking on behalf of a government, um, I think that one of the challenges is that um, we, I mean, accepting it's true, it is true, that the, the, the challenge then is how do we engage? So for instance, we are, I'm not talking about Canada domestically, because of course the other thing is important to recognize about these action plans is the action plans were also, in, in our case, was also a domestic action plan. It's not just about how we engage internationally, but what we do domestically to address clear issues that we have nationally. Um, but if, to the extent that we are engaging internationally, uh, with, for instance, monies that we offer to organizations, to aid organizations, to, to um, journalists, for instance, as uh, Dr. Weiss was mentioning, journalists, which we, we do to support media organizations as well for free speech, we can, as governments, specifically require inclusion. Now, that is a blunt instrument, um, but um, it is a necessary one. Um, since since I have the talking stick at the moment, and I will have to cut off, unfortunately, relatively quickly, I just wanted to mention on on um, um, on the point that was made um, a little bit concerning the uh, inclusion. Of course, I think that's one of the problems that we have is we don't have enough inclusion. Um, but you mentioned that technology increases noise. Inc inclusivity also increases noise, right? That's that's one of the reasons why many have been reluctant to include certain voices, because well, it's difficult then to focus. How do we ensure that we're dealing? We want to get to one specific outcome, and um, the on the this part of the problem is that we're often looking at paper solutions. We're looking at short-term solutions for long-term problems. They are poverty. They are endemic issues. They are. Uh, structural issues, uh, they may be international, they may be national, subnational, but very often they go back to class and they go to poverty. And um, I think one of the things that we have to keep in mind, because very often when we're talking about this is, we need, if in the context of identity driven dialogues, um, we need to keep in mind that many of these issues cut across, uh, they may be within groups, but the groups are often divided by class. And I say this as, a, as somebody who began as a practicing lawyer, working with dispute mediation, doing uh, 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 doing uh, non-conflict resolution or or uh, labor negotiations. Where what I was struck by was how you could often have two women across the table, but the women were separated by 
an enormous amount of income, education, and ex life experience from the women they were representing. And I remember one comment made by some of the women who were engaged in one of a, a dispute resolution exercise where I was where I was leading on one side, saying that these people have no idea what we experience. And I think that's also something that we have to keep in mind. And just in respect of the, and I'm sorry, this because I, I, um, I will have to cut off, but on on the the pointed question about uh, for this exercise, which is about how to tailor your workshop, I think one of the problems is ensuring that you do not take bite off more than you can chew, because all of the issues that have been raised here are all incredibly valid. But I think that the part of the biggest problem that we can identify in respect some of the issues that we've seen 1325 the 1325 conversation that took place in the un security council on the 20th anniversary is a really good example of it, where we had many partners who were saying we can't believe that there's an effort of backsliding and part of the problem was there just isn't an awareness of gender sensitivity there just isn't an awareness of what this actually means and i think that that's one of the things that gender sensitive training is extremely important but i think it's extremely important to recognize that the action plan is just clear a path as it was also mentioned and that's our role is we're, we have to be careful to step back i think that your exercise this dialogue exercise fills a very important gap by dealing at a very practical level with some of the training that's necessary but i think we have to keep in mind that a lot of the other stuff is in the background and there's only so much that one can accomplish it it is really just one step in a long path sorry thank you thank you very much for that I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, so the second question that has been posed for the panel is, Café Diplomatico is an initiative designed to enhance capacity in preventive peace building. And what are the potential benefits, what potential benefits does increasing women's capacity in negotiation and mediation processes have for preventing or ending conflict and how can it help? And I believe that this has already been addressed in some of the um, presentations, but maybe we can, revisit it because it is uh, the issue of training. I think it is an important issue. Uh, like D Judge Solomon mentioned, it's not about training women and maybe it's about training men, but um, I think it would be interesting to have a, a, a further discussion about how you view uh, the potential of Cafe Diplomatico and future training uh, to strengthen the role of women in peace building. Judge Solomon or Sandra? Yeah, I didn't, sorry, I didn't realize that you were directing it necessarily at me. Cause I, I mean, I, I think, of course, I think that the training is, is critical. Um, I, I, I think that the, the training of gender awareness as, as the um, ambassador said from Canada, I think that it's, it, it's very important that there is training for people to understand what is the value added of a gender in inclusion. But I think there's more to it than that. I think that the, the training should be hand in hand with the research about the impact of that training and how it has changed the perspectives of the people involved and what the, how the training itself has changed because of the perspectives brought by the people who are involved in the training. I think that there is a two-way um, engagement that should be that should define the nature of the training, um, because we can't be rolling out a lot of training about you know how do you negotiate in in particular contexts if that context is not the context in which the women who are being trained are experiencing the conflict. Um, we have a lot of I'm sorry, <laughs> we have a lot of issues, for instance, in relation to gang engagement. Are we getting, and, and how that is done is uh, extremely difficult. I completely agree that inclusion creates noise. But the point that I was trying to make with that inclusion is that in doing so, we need to hone our peace building craft and that includes training to ensure that that inclusion does not just become noise. It has to become something far more meaningful, but it can't be left out. And I think that that really 
is the mindset of the training. How do we shift our craft and, and, and improve our craft by developing a training mechanism that goes both ways, that is expansive and um, encourages greater inclusivity, knowing that it is a difficult process. Right, it's, it, it includes beyond training also, it's an educational process, raising awareness yes. that we, yes, yeah. Uh, Ambassador Honoré, would you like to comment? I think you're muted. I agree with what uh, uh, I wouldn't add anything at this point. Thank you. Okay, so we have one more question that we just received from the audience, and we just have just a few minutes left. Um, Excuse me, Madeline. Yes. Hello. I'm, I'm, my apologies for interrupting. I, I believe Professor Lazidis wants to uh, wants to make a, a point on that last question. Oh, okay. Yes, uh, thank you, thank you, Liam. Uh, uh, just, just a very quick point because uh, Elizabeth has come and uh, remind me of the moment in, in our negotiation training where uh, Bertul um, and, and and our participants realize uh, how offensive one of the simulations uh, was uh, for uh, women. I think it had to do with. Um, buying a car or something across those lines. Even if you look at some of the uh, leading handbooks in our field, there are simulations there and exercises that are clearly offensive. There is this one I was reading the other day, the 100 Most Beautiful Women sequential simulation. I can put it on the chat in a second. This was a book by one of the leading Harvard professors in 2003. So just to add to your point, Elizabeth, uh, uh, it's negotiation theory. Uh, that needs um, uh, women networks to come in to the discussion and point to the weaknesses of uh, existing uh, dominant, if you wish, scientific, quote unquote, thinking uh, about uh, about those uh, issues. But the, the relationship is clearly interactive because uh, within within a given population, what we realize are the people with not so great ideas who know how to negotiate them. And on the other side, you have people with great ideas who might not necessarily have developed the skills uh, to put forward their ideas and, and, and negotiate. And this is what Cafe Diplomatico does, trying to build those, uh, those uh, uh, skills. The, the networks are extremely important as well. One cannot disentangle opportunity from training because the networks come in. Uh, it's an important uh, uh, intermediary variable where they, they, they bring uh, those uh, resources and, and, and voice. But again, the, the danger here, as you have mentioned, is that this can become a substitute for opportunity. And this is the trap we don't want to uh, uh, don't want to fall in. Um, we have the network there for women uh, shouldn't be uh, included in the in the top positions. Um, and and uh, to the point about inclusivity, uh, one of the tools that we developed uh, in Cafe Diplomatico, uh, is um, uh, linking the participants with surveys. So we can see when people um, have uh, participated in a particular simulation, uh, we can see their own impressions. They can fill up a questionnaire so we can have the data. For instance, if we're negotiating a particular um, a, a particular uh, issue, we can see how well uh, female mediators uh, can do compared to male mediators. So we can have the evidence as well. It, it's a built-in component, uh, if you wish, of, uh, of, um, of Cafe Diplomatico. Also another tool that we have developed as part of the initiative, uh, how, how do you consult people when you have multiple actors and uh, multiple issues? Uh, we have used some experiments uh, that can be very useful. And, and these are technical knowledge that people can use in their own uh, in, internal consultations as as well, so there is a scholarly uh, aspect uh, to to this, and one that tries to go beyond some of the dominant uh, views, uh, both in the field and also in the practice of mediation. Uh, 
Thank you, Neil. Yes, that was uh, very important, that uh, clarification. So I think we're almost, we've uh, almost run out of time. So we might have to just uh, go into the concluding remarks from uh, the partners uh, before we adjourn. So I will give the floor to Professor Loisides and then uh, from the University of Kent and then Mr. Liam Whittington from the Forum of Federations. And I would just like to take advantage of this opportunity to once again um, express our most sincere appreciation to uh, for, for to the speakers for this excellent uh, program today. Neil? Yeah? yeah, Liam, would you like to go first or? Uh, I, I think I think actually, Neil, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Chelik to to speak. Um, uh, Batul, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. It was great to hear from uh, uh, colleagues who've been active in, uh, in peace building, uh, and I. This confirms all the things that we were committed to do. Uh, and uh, just briefly, I want to re-emphasize what has been already said uh, in terms of what a Women Mediators Network can do. Uh, they can provide opportunity structures for women in polarized societies like mine in Turkey uh, to come under their women identity umbrella to discuss the issues that divide them and find what I call gray areas uh, 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 for collaboration. They can also teach their members ethics of care. This has been emphasized uh, uh, by various speakers today. And care perspective brings a vision of mediation that is less about power relations and hierarchy and more about the relational aspects of the conflict. And the ability to listen and negotiate with understanding with those with whom one does not agree. And I care a lot about uh, Cafe Diplomatico on this, learning about this uh, listening skills and developing an understanding. And it is this emphasis on relational aspect in mediation that makes women mediators a special asset to peace processes. They can also build trust environments where women can find entry into difficult to talk issues. Uh, however, I believe uh, there needs to be certain uh, commitment from actors uh, to have such networks. Uh, first of all, even though much peace building initiatives are community-based, they are not linked to track one processes. This has been emphasized by various speakers. We need to create uh, linkages between formal and informal processes and involve as, as wide a range of actors as possible uh, according to their added value. Last, uh, but not least, there needs to be more financial commitment from the governments for these networks to do the jobs. Uh, without budgets that we see in most uh, NAPs, uh, uh, 1325 NAPs, these networks cannot, without these budgets, these networks cannot create the safe environment for them to talk, train uh, women who are out there, uh, and uh, cannot provide knowledge uh, sharing opportunities. So I, I hope uh, this would provide uh, a, a good uh, opportunity for governments to commit more on uh, such networks. Thank you. Thank you, Bisonia. Would you like to say a few words and I'll, I'll, I'll save my things for last. Yes, uh, uh, th th thank you very much, uh, Liam. Uh, it, it was very, uh, it, it was an extremely uh, interesting uh, panel that uh, highlighted both the potential uh, of uh, inclusivity, but also its uh, its limits. How how can we get more inclusivity uh, without um, uh, facing the problem of um, noise that interferes with the process of uh, resolving? Uh, an issue. And this is where negotiation theory uh, could come in as a useful tool uh, to improve consultations, to improve uh, participation, but also negotiation theory, as most of um, um, uh, social science, a series of social science, it comes with weak weaknesses. I just pointed one uh, in the in the in the chart. How how, how far behind uh, our field has been uh, in this area. Uh, for us, it was a privilege working with OAS in the form of federation. I think the least uh, likely group uh, to need uh, mediation training are diplomats appointed to the Organization of American States, a highly uh, skilled uh, colleagues uh, who have uh, 
have done extremely well uh, in their careers. But what we learn ourselves uh, in this process as participants in this training is how to improve our mediation training. And hopefully this knowledge uh, in the future can be uh, reflected in publications like the ones uh, uh, we produce with OAS, but also it can trickle down in other areas. We would like to have this type of negotiation training uh, become more available to universities uh, in the Americas, become available even in, in high schools, uh, where students can learn those skills early enough and learn how to develop them further, because this is an evolving discipline. This is a, a knowledge uh, that um, uh, is changing uh, with the times and very important uh, for us uh, to catch up with some of those uh, uh, needs and realities as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neo. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I'd like to thank all our panelists, first of all, um, for their wonderful contributions. It's, it's excellent for us to hear from the experiences of senior practitioners who are working every day in this uh, to improve the situation. Um, I have a, a, little, a couple of things to say about, I guess, our aspirations uh, for what we'd like Cafe Diplomatico to be. And, but first, I'd just like to acknowledge um, the contributions of, uh, of our two colleagues who are also on the call. That's Jamie Thomas, my forum colleague, and Natalia Melgarejo, our colleague at the OAS, um, for their contributions to this as well. Um, you won't be hearing from them today, but they've made a, an essential contribution. Uh, so in terms of, of where we see and what uh, we aspire for Cafe Diplomatico, I think it's very, very important, um, this idea of both opportunity and capacity. And I think that uh, one of our aspirations for, for our project is to try and bring both of those together. We know that uh, while peace may be made, as many contributors have, have already commented at, at the highest levels, you might say the peace is built uh, uh, you know, from the bottom up. And so there is an absolute necessity, uh, I think, for us to in increase the ability of women, youth, indigenous peoples, other marginalized groups to have the skills that enable them to represent their interests in these processes more effectively. And if mediation and negotiation capacity can do that, uh, I think that's one way that we can contribute to this idea of preventative peace building, which I think is something that we would all subscribe to. And I think that what we are trying to, one of the things we're trying to do with Cabo Diplomatico is to make these these principles, these ideas, these concepts of negotiation mediation more accessible because as Professor Lazid has said, they have been um, around for some time, but they tend to be um, uh, confined to, you know, um, uh, academia, uh, to uh, high level politicians, the most senior levels of politicians, but we see a value in increasing the accessibility of that as a means of inclusivity. Um, because the more we understand, the more people understand about how they can resolve their differences without resorting to violence, the less likely we have conflict. Um, and so I think that, you know, as Magdalena mentioned, this kind of two-track approach of developing, supporting uh, a media network for the Americas and increasing the capacity of people within the countries in the Americas to mediate, to negotiate, is something that we, we hope we can take, um, expand out further, and we hope it could make a very valuable contribution to, to what we all want, which is a more peaceful hemisphere. Uh, so I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Magdalena. Thank you very much, Liam. And I'd just, just like to follow up with what you and, uh, and Neil have said, as we all know, um, uh, minorities, vulnerable and at-risk groups are the most affected by violence and conflict. And, uh, women among those uh, vulnerable and at-risk groups even more so. And just to finalize with some, some important information that I think reflects uh, this, uh, the, the, the suffering and the discrimination that is felt um, and that creates the instability, the regional instability within uh, our societies. Um, women and girls and particularly indigenous and Afro-descended females are even more disproportionately vulnerable to discrimination and violence. And uh, the rigid gender roles uh, limit their participation in the labor market and their economic autonomy. Almost one third of women depend on others for their livelihood. And uh, a recent ECLEC report have included that 25% of women between 25 and 59 in the region have no income of their own at all, compared to 8% of men. 
white men are 62% more likely to be called for a job interview and will earn two and a half times more than, for example, an Afro-descendant woman with the same level of education. And um, minority women and girls living in multidimensional poverty are also at higher risk of intimate partner violence. In fact, during the COVID-19 pandemic, as we highlighted in our guide, um, cases of intimate partner violence against women and girls in many OAS member states increased between 20 and 100%. Um, the regional rate of female homicides in, in, is double the world rate. So I say this um, because it's, it is, it is, if we're going to have peace in the hemisphere, we need to uh, continue to focus on the challenges that women face, uh, especially minority women. And part of Café Diplomatico is bringing this training uh, in its new, uh, forms as we continue to develop it to these uh, minority and at-risk groups um, in every corner of our region. So once again, thank you very much to everybody who has participated today. Thank you for the wonderful speakers that took time out of their very busy schedules to, to join us. Uh, our Secretary General for his uh, remarks uh, uh, of welcome and, and his comments on the guide. Uh, Professor uh, Chelik as well for your contributions to, to all our efforts. Professor Loisides, Liam Whittington and, and Jamie Thomas from the Forum of Federations and Natalia Melgarejo from our own Secretariat of Strengthening Democracy. Um, we are all extremely grateful and we hope that this will be uh, um, an important contribution uh, to the, uh, the efforts to strengthen the role of women in peace building and uh, make some progress on the implementation of Resolution 1325 in the Americas. So thank you very much to all.